Hello and welcome everyone to today's presentation. I'm Diane Okonski, president of the Icelandic National League of the United States, and I'm very happy you were able to join us today. Uh, before we get started on the presentation itself, I've just got a couple of things to talk about. Talk about. Um, the first is that you are on mute. However, don't let that stop you from asking questions. Just use the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. Or if you are on a tablet or a smartphone, uh, that button may be either in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, or you may have to swipe to find it. But uh, don't let that stop you. We will get to as many questions as possible um, during the course of the presentation. Secondly, the presentation is being recorded and will be available on the INLUS website in just a couple of days. So uh, today we are just absolutely thrilled to have with us Nancy Marie Brown and Carrie Kozabel uh, to talk with us about Icelandic horses and the Icelandic horse industry in the US. Uh, many of you know Nancy as an author, but uh, she is a passionate um, Icelandic horse owner as well. Uh, and Carrie has been in the horse business for her horse uh, as a horse lover for many years, um, but is newer to the Icelandic uh, uh, horse culture and uh, will be sharing her perspectives as she, as she uh, can. So I am going to now just turn it over to Carrie and you can take it from here. So welcome both Nancy and Carrie. We're so happy to have you with us. Thank you, Diane. Good evening, everyone. I'm Carrie Kazubel, and like many of you, I'm a proud member of the INL US and interested in all things Icelandic. But I think the thing I love the most about Iceland is the Icelandic horse. I just got my first IC last summer, um, but that was part of a journey that for me started several years ago on my first trip to Iceland. Um, a few years and a couple of trips to Iceland later, I was just beginning to think that maybe it wasn't so crazy to want to own an Icelandic horse in California, but I didn't have a clue where to start or who to talk to. While doing some research online, I came across this book, A Good Horse Has No Color by Nancy Marie Brown. And you know how sometimes the right book comes into your life at just the right time? Well, this book was one of those for me. It's a book about, the Iceland about Icelandic horses, sure, but it's also about Iceland. The people, the language, the geography and the sagas, as well as a very touching personal journey um, of, uh, to bring Icelandic horses into a, an American life. And Nancy's journey is one of the reasons I went from, could I even do this? To why couldn't I do this? And this is one of the reasons I'm so excited to be part of this presentation tonight. As Diane mentioned, Nancy is a scholar, a historian, a talented author, and an incredible ambassador for Iceland and the Icelandic course. So I'm honored to turn this over um, to the woman we all came to hear, Nancy Marie Brown. Thank you, Carrie. I'm going to give you a little presentation about the Icelandic horse and then ask, uh, answer as many questions as I can. So the first um, question is always, how did I get involved in Icelandic horses? So, and we, there we are. How did I get to write this book? Um, I was studying Icelandic sagas and medieval literature in college, uh, as well as studying creative writing. And I first went to Iceland in 1986 in order to see the saga sites. Somebody put me on a horse. And I should say that was the end of that. Um, 10 years and several long rides later, I decided that I was going to buy two horses to bring home. My husband, who was not yet a writer, a rider, he was a writer, but not a rider. Um, he went along with the idea on one condition that I write a book about it. So I did. Easy as that, right? So now here we are. Here's how the book begins. I could hear the horses before I saw them. 
their hoof beats the high slap of cupped hands clapping, beating the punctuated four beat rhythm of the tolt, the breed's distinctive running walk gait. From our summer house, I watched them through binoculars, pinpricks on the silvery wet sand. They shimmered like a vision out of the Icelandic sagas, the medieval literature that had brought me to Iceland in the first place. Briefly, the horses took shape as they cut across the tide flats. Necks arced high, canes rippling, long tails floating behind. Their short legs curved and struck, curved and struck. I would watch them until they disappeared beyond the black headland and wonder who the riders were, where they went on their rapid journey. I wanted to go with them. Icelandic folk tales warn of the gray horse that comes out of the water, submits briefly to bridle and saddle, and at dusk carries its rider into the sea. For me, it was the water who was carried away. Here is one of the horses that I bought in 1997. When a friend of mine saw this photo for the first time, she said, some serious horse here and some serious landscape here. This is where my first horse came from. Why did I want Icelandic horses, not just any horse? Because Icelandic horses are different. They are different in many ways. They are small and shaggy and cute. They have special gates and they come in lots of colors, but they're woven into the history and culture of Iceland. And what's most important about Icelandic horses, I think, is their character. These are horses you can trust. The character building starts when they are born. Look at the rocks on this hillside. This foal is only a day or two old. No American would let a mare give birth to a foal in this pasture. Most horses in America of other breeds are born in a, quote, clean, disinfected stall that is as foolproof and safe as humanly possible, according to the classic handbook, Blessed Are the Broodmares. But Icelandic horses are born in nature, horses. And they're allowed to grow up like horses. Unlike a thoroughbred, for instance, which can be fully trained and racing at age two, an Icelandic horse isn't introduced to the saddle until it is three or four. For its first years, it runs wild in a herd, learning the hierarchy, learning to be a horse. It interacts with people only occasionally, sometimes as infrequently as twice a year, when the herd is rounded up and moved to different grazings. This makes an Icelandic horse sure-footed sure-footed, dependable, and smart. Even at four, it is ridden only long enough to accept the idea. Real training in gates and obedience begins the winter the horse turns five, when it will be brought into a stable for the first time and worked for a few minutes every day through the summer. The horse isn't considered mature enough to ride on an all day trek until it's six, or seven, but everywhere in Iceland, you see people out riding on all day treks. What makes Icelandic horses so much fun to ride for long distances are the gates. Like other breeds of horse, the Icelandic horse can walk, trot, and canter, but it can also tult. The tult is a smooth dancing step without any bumps or jolts as the horse lifts one foot and another in a quickening of the walk. It sounds like this, Black and Decker, Black and Decker, Black and Decker, Black and Decker. The tolt is as old as the earliest of Prince. When anthropologist Mary Leakey uncovered the tracks of three, three and a half million year old equids in East Africa, she found their footfalls to match those of an Icelandic horse traveling at 10 miles an hour. In the early Middle Ages, horses throughout Europe looked like today's Icelandic horse, 
about 13 to 14 hands tall. In 11th century Italy, a Norman knight rode a horse so small his stirrups bumped on the ground. French and English horses were no taller, as we can see from the Bayou Tapestry, sewn around 1075 to celebrate the Norman conquest. Great horses of 16 hands tall did not appear in Western Europe until late in the 13th century. These were bred for the knights in shining armor. Their armor alone weighed over a hundred pounds. To create these horses, tall stallions from Central Asia and North Africa were imported. These were put to the biggest native European mares and the foals were allowed to graze on watery meadows with calcium rich limestone soil. Their diets were further supplemented with oats. Until this selective breed regime pulled, a knight's mount resembled today's Icelandic horse, as these two examples from around 1200 show. Selective breeding also changed the horse's gates. Most breeds of horse today, as I said, have three gates, walk, trot, and canter. But in the ninth century, when Iceland was discovered, people rode horses all day. A good horse had to have some medium speed gait other than a jarring, jouncing trot. Throughout the Middle Ages, such a horse was known as an ambler or a palfrey and would be ridden by ladies or noblemen or knights when they were not in armor. In these pictures of my riding instructor, Siren Grimio's daughter and her stallion, Parker, you can see the difference between the trot on top and the tolt below it. The trot is a diagonal gait, making the horse's backbone go up and down. The tolt is a lateral gait, making the backbone shimmy from side to side. When roads became widespread during the Renaissance and carriages became the noble way to travel, selective breeding for smooth gaited riding horses declined. People bred instead for good trotters, which were faster and had more stamina when under harness. Only in the roadless outposts of European culture were the smooth lateral gates like the Tolt retained, producing in the new world, such breeds as the Tennessee walking horse and the Peruvian Paso, and in Europe, the Icelandic horse. The modern Tolt can be slow and smooth, so slow that you won't spill your beer, or it can be very fast. Some Icelandic horses also have a fifth gait called the flying pace. This is a racing gait and not used over long distances. According to, to recent genetic studies, Icelandic horses need to have two copies of a certain gene in order to be able to pace. But they need to have one copy of this so-called gatekeeper gene to be able to tolt. So it's an easy trait to lose if you don't selectively breed for it. Icelandic breeders also do not restrict the horse's colors, like the breeders, for example, of the Norwegian Fjord horse do. Icelandic horses retain genes for every horse color and pattern except Appaloosa spotting. There are bays, chestnuts, sorrels, duns, pintos, palominos, blacks, whites, and grays. There are horses as blue-black as ash or the dusty gray of pumice. There are piebalds and paints like snow lying on broken ground. Iceland and its horses are inseparable. That's never more true than in the sagas. I'm using the sagas loosely here to mean all of Iceland's medieval literature. From the 1100s to the 1300s, Icelanders produced books at an enormous rate. More medieval literature exists in Icelandic than in any other European language, except Latin. And horses appear in all of it. Some of my favorite Icelandic horse stories come from the Lanamabok, or Book of Settlements, a more or less factual account of about 400 people who came to Iceland at the height of Viking age, between 870 and 930. They built and lived in turf houses, like this one. 
Iceland's first settlers came from Scandinavia and the British Isles. So we can assume that their horses came from those parts of Europe too. But one called Kinskire came from Eastern Europe or Central Asia. According to the saga that mentions him, Kinskire was an extremely tall horse that had to be fed on grain both summer and winter. The other horses brought to Iceland would likewise have been exceptional in one way or another. Viking ships were very small. As the stories point out, horses in early Iceland were first of all beasts of burden, carrying everything from coffins to charcoal to hay bales to roof beams. Iceland's landscape with its high mountains, wide bogs and mires, impassable lava fields and torrential glacier fed rivers made wagons impractical and roads were not built in many parts of the country until the 20th century. A sturdy, strong horse, pleasant to ride, but able to carry heavy loads over long distances was the one tool that could open Iceland's vast empty lands and stitch its scattered settlements into a society. But my favorite horse in the book of settlements is a racehorse. Late in the settlement period, around the year 900, the story goes, a cargo ship carrying horses landed at Kolkuos in Skagafjord. While the ship was being unloaded, Flua escaped. A man named Thor of Dovenose bought the chance of finding her, and find her he did. She was an exceptionally fast horse. Okay, the story goes. Thor was riding Flua on Kjöller, one of the two summer routes that crossed the center of Iceland, when he was waylaid by a mysterious character named Orm, a sorcerer who used to wander from one part of the country to another. Orm bet Thor a hundred marks of silver, a fantastic sum, that his horse was faster than Flua. The two men rode on until they reached a flat stretch of land, laid out a course and raced off. But according to the story, Orn was only halfway up this racetrack by the time Thor met him on his way back. So great was the difference between the two horses. Orn took his loss so badly that he rode off into the mountains and was never seen again. The story doesn't say if he paid up or not. Blue, for her part, was exhausted, so Thor left her behind, switching his saddle to another one of his horses and continued on his way. When Thor came back to get Flua several weeks later, he was surprised to find a gray stallion with his mare. Where he had left Flua was far from any farms in a rugged part of the country with little grass. That fact and the mystery surrounding Orn's appearance, disappearance hints that the stallion was the sorcerer himself. Fluga had a foal the next spring, the story goes, and from their line sprang the horse Aethfaxi, for whom an Icelandic horse magazine is named. I like to think of Aethfaxi as the Phaeacian sire of the Icelandic horse breed, for in each Icelandic horse, there is a little bit of magic. So I'm happy to report that my long range plan was a success. My husband learned to ride when he was 50 years old, and we now have four Icelandic horses and a hundred acre horse farm in Vermont. We ride together almost every day. One day after we had raced up the dirt road to our house, Chuck turned to me and said, joy just bubbles up inside me when I ride this horse. So how can you get a little of that magic and joy for yourself? The International Association FIFE is an acronym that means something like Friends of the Icelandic Horse. It is the umbrella organization for Icelandic horse associations in 21 countries. In the US, ours is the United States Icelandic Horse Congress or USIHC. On its website, you will find answers to most of your questions about Icelandic horses in the US. You don't need to have an Icelandic horse to join the USIHC and get this phenomenal magazine, for which I'm one of the editors. 
All of our issues since 2008 are online and there's a topic index to help you find the information you need. There's also a list of farms in each issue and elsewhere on the website where you can meet or buy an Icelandic course. And finally, like the Icelandic League of the US, joining the USIHC is a great way to meet people who share your passion for Iceland. So I'll close this part of the presentation with a little advertisement for my other book about Iceland. A Good Horse Has No Color is the book I shared with you today. Song of the Vikings is a biography of the great Icelandic writer and chieftain Snorri Sturluson. Ivory Vikings is a biography of the Lewis Chessmen, an argument that they were made in Iceland. The two books on the right, The Saga of Gudrid the Far Traveler and The Far Traveler, both tell the story of the Viking expeditions to North America from a woman's point of view. I wrote The Far Traveler, which is nonfiction, first, then wrote a young adult novel based on it. And the book in the center is my newest book. It comes out in August, but is available for pre-order. The Real Valkyrie is subtitled The Hidden History of Viking Warrior Women. And I'll be talking to you about it in a webinar in September. So now, Carrie, I'm going to turn the microphone back to you and see what kind of questions we can answer. Mute is off. All right. Everyone can hear me? Right. I can hear you. Okay, great. Yes, we do have a few questions here. Um, and I can't wait to hear the webinar in September talking about the new book. Um, okay, so questions about Icelandic horses, staying on topic here. Um, how many Icelandics are in the United States? Are they imported or bred here? And mm -hmm. is there a discernible difference between imported versus domestic bred? My numbers are not going to be exact, but I think from the last um, uh, registers re registrar's report at the annual meeting, there are something like 6,000 Icelandic horses registered in the U.S. now. Um, that is nothing like the millions of quarter horses that there are. So we are still very much a rare breed. And only about 50 or so foals are registered each year. So we are very small in terms of domestic breeding. There's now a, a push in the USIHC, especially within the breeding committee to encourage people to breed more uh, horses domestically because we have at least a hundred evaluated stallions in the US. So only half of them are getting bred every year and who knows how many evaluated mares or, or top mares there are. So um, we have a lot of room to grow. Now, as to the difference between imported and domestic, that's um, very much a matter of opinion. The one thing you can say is that imported horses generally are not exposed to uh, midges or biting insects because there are none in Iceland. So many of them, when they come over, develop an allergy to insect bites of a certain kind. And that can be a a big management problem uh, where they, they get rashes and itching like lots of mosquito bites. So that can be a problem for imported horses, whereas domestic horses are usually exposed to those and develop antibodies uh, or the, the mare is exposed to it. And so the foal develops antibodies you know, from birth. Uh, what I have seen having, let's see, I have had three Icelandic born horses and two domestic horses. In my little herd, I have seen that the domestic horses don't get along with each other the way the Icelandic bred horses do. I have two domestic horses that came from the same breeder who can't be kept in a paddock together because they just beat each other up all the time. And they've, they've lived together you know, on my farm for 12 years now, so they should have gotten over it, but they didn't. Um, they don't seem to understand the herd dynamics the way the Icelandic horses that from Iceland that are brought up in a big herd do. 
And there's also some questions as to how much easier that understanding of hierarchy and herd dynamics is for training them. Um, we have found that our Icelandic born Icelandics are easier to work with than our domestic Icelandics, but that can also be just the individual horse. So it's really hard to tell whether some of these traits are just the character of an individual horse or whether it's because it didn't grow up long enough in a big herd. But the big, the problem that we have in the US is that you generally do not get a herd of 30 to 50 Icelandics for your little foal to grow up in and you know to learn how to deal with all kinds of different characters. So if a domestic bred horse grows up in a herd of five, we feel like that's wonderful. Two, you know, so it's uh, it's a little bit different how they're raised. Right. Well, we've had a couple of questions about how Icelandic horses deal with the different climates that we have in North America, in the U.S. Um, and, you know, especially around how they tolerate heat and humidity. Um, one thing that's in, that I was told was important when I brought my horses over was to always bring them over in the fall or winter so that they aren't suddenly hit with the high temperatures. Now, that's not always possible, um, but some of the things that you can do if you're bringing a horse to California, for example, is to shave it so that it doesn't have thick hair. Uh, you also have to read up on electrolytes and make sure that your horse is, is not dehydrated. Um, we found that all three of our horses that came over from Iceland got sick right away. They came down with a cold essentially because they had no immunity to anything. Uh, there, there are no Icelandic horse, there are no horse diseases in Iceland. So they all got sick. Um, that didn't really bother them so much. They, they got over it right away, but you, you do have to give them, you know, some time to adjust and not expect them to be you know, at their best right away. The, the third horse that we brought over, she not only got sick, um, she had a real hard time adjusting. Uh, she, she very much shut down. Her, her personality just completely changed. And it took her, I would say two years to come back to the same horse that she was in Iceland and to really get used to the new routines and uh, the changes. So different horses adapt in different ways. And I think the most important thing is just to take it slow and to try to introduce your horse to new things very slowly. Some of the things that we never would have expected our horses to be afraid of when they first came over from Iceland were little things like chipmunks. I'd be riding my horse down the, the road and a chipmunk would squeak at the side of the road and the horse would jump sideways about eight feet. And I couldn't even figure out like, why was she afraid? What was she afraid of until I finally figured out it was the chipmunk squeak. So, you know, things that you just never even think of scare them to death because they've never heard it. They have no idea what those little furry creatures are and um, it takes a while. Yeah. So, um, yes, clipping can help quite a bit in those hot, humid areas, electrolytes. In my experience, they are very good at, um, uh, at, at staying up on their water intake. Some other breeds that I've worked with, um, were not as smart about staying uh, properly hydrated as the Icelandics I've worked with. Um, but yes, I, after 30 years of uh, owning horses, I just learned how to do a full body clip <laughs> last summer. <laughs> and now I've got some well, amazing yeah. others. I, I've had the advantage of always living in colder parts of the country. I mean, I first brought my horses to Pennsylvania and then we moved to Vermont. So it's, uh, I've never had to clip. I've never done even a trace clip. 
because if it's too cold, you know, if it's too hot or if it's too cold, we just don't ride. And we generally have to worry more about the horses being too cold than, than too hot in those sorts of places. So, you know, I don't like to sweat. So I don't, I don't go out riding if it's 90 degrees, forget that. Um, and it's in Vermont, there's like two or three days a year when I you know, would say it's too hot to ride. And there's about two months when it's too cold to ride. Sometimes three months, it depends on the winter. But these horses do great in the cold weather. I mean, they, they will be lying down in the snow and it's 20 below zero and the sun is shining and they're just taking a sun bath. They refuse to go in the barn. They, they have access to it all the time. There's food and water in the barn. They don't go in. No, they want to sunbathe. So, you know, I haven't had to deal with the really hot weather that you have to, but uh, the cold weather, they take that just fine. There was a question about using the term Icelandic ponies. Is it interchangeable? Mm. That's again, um, a matter of opinion. Um, people from Iceland get very upset if you call them Icelandic ponies because for them, pony is a small horse suitable only for children. They don't actually have that word in Icelandic. I think it's small hester, which means small horse. Um, pony, however, has a lot of different meanings in English. You can have a cow pony, you can have a polo pony. These are not small horses only ridden by children. They are highly athletic, you know, trained horses. Um, pony also comes from the Celtic goddess Epona. So in some ways it is a, you know, an ancient, you know, sacred term for horses. So if you're visiting me, you will probably hear me call my horses ponies. Um, but when I go to Iceland, they are horses. I never would call them ponies in Icelandic or in Iceland. Um, and it's, it's a matter of respect. So technically they are Icelandic horses, but because we love them, we sometimes call them ponies. So um, there have been a couple questions about special tack, special saddles for Icelandic horses and whether those are required and uh, what you would recommend. Definitely, I would recommend an Icelandic saddle. Um, Icelandic horses are not built like regular American horses. They have no withers. So most saddles will just slide up their neck and they have very round barrels. So they're extremely hard to fit. And to get a, a good tolt, to get the gates, you need to be able to have the shoulders free. So the saddle has to be cut properly so that it doesn't um, pinch their shoulders. So I've only ever used Icelandic saddles, but in the 24, five, 20 something years that I've had Icelandic horses, Icelandic saddles have changed an awful lot. So I've actually gone through more saddles than I have through horses because um, Icelanders used to like to have a very flat saddle where you practically slid off the back um, now they're getting more into a dressage saddle that has a nice knee roll and, and you know, sort of cups you in place more. Um, I, I prefer the newer ones. They're, they feel much more safe to me now. But uh, in order to make both the rider and the horse comfortable, uh, I think it's important to buy a saddle that is made for the horse the type of horse. Now there are Icelandic saddles made by some German tack makers and there's some uh, others that are specifically made for this kind of horse. So you don't absolutely have to buy it from Iceland, but I always have. And one of the beautiful things about the internet is um, there are 
um, it, it's not difficult now to find very high quality Icelandic saddles from dealers in the United States that import them um, and you know, are great sources of information. Um, you do see them come up used not, you know, from time to time on Facebook pages and things like that. Um, someone had asked, how, how would you find an Iceland Icelandic saddle? And well, one, I, one answer is uh, if you get the Icelandic course quarterly, if you join the USIHC and the Icelandic course quarterly, there's advertisements for at least three tax shops in every issue. Um, and there are also regional clubs that are associated with the USIHC. And if you join a regional club, many of them have newsletters where they sell uh, used tack. So for instance, I'm a member of the Northeast Icelandic Horse Club, and there were about three used saddles that came up for sale in the last few weeks. So that's always, and you can always put out a request on one of those mailing lists if you're looking for a saddle. And um, somebody like me who has an extra saddle in their closet will give you a call and say, sure. And try this out. And I, I just want to give a, a plug for the USIHC as well. Um, I know you mentioned it in your presentation, Nancy, that it's a great resource, even if you don't have an Icelandic horse, if you're interested in the breed. Um, I joined as a member before I had a horse and I'm very glad I did. And the quarterly, the magazine that the USIHC produces is incredible. Such high quality, well-written, informative articles. It's the, I think it's $60 a year to be a member. And to me, the magazine alone is worth that. And then there are benefits with to, to being a member, like discounts with certain uh, tax shops and, um, and things like that. So if, uh, if you are interested in Icelandic horses in America, and you haven't looked at the um, United States Icelandic Horse Congress, do it. Um, okay, so some other questions here. Um, there's a question about, does the breed have issues with insulin resistance and metabolic issues that make them prone to founder and laminitis? I'm not sure if it's metabolic or if it's just, um, well, it is genetic in some way. Horses in Iceland, through the ages, got lots to eat in the summer and nothing to eat in the winter. Because uh, from the settlement, it was very difficult to make hay in Iceland. So up until round bales came in in you know, the 80s or 90s, um, lots of your hay would, not, would go moldy or would not be useful. So you first gave the hay to the cows, then you gave the hay to the sheep, and then you gave hay to the horses. So the horses could go much of the winter without anything but whatever dead grass they could find or tree branches or seaweed. And then as soon as that green grass started in the spring, they would eat it and eat it and eat it. So we find that our horses, Icelandic horses that come to America think they have gone to heaven. There is green grass all the time. And if they see it, they will eat it. So it's not like uh, thoroughbreds where you sometimes have to worry that they're not getting enough to eat. If your Icelandic horse ever stops eating, you call the vet immediately because something really, really is wrong. Um, you can't let them stay out on grass. You just can't. Um, have a dirt paddock, which is where they are, oh, maybe 18 hours a day at least. And they get to be out on the grass, maybe, you know, a few hours, and then they get some hay. But if you let them stay out on grass too long, they will founder. Um, so that is definitely a problem. It's a, it's a management issue rather than, um, a health issue because 
we can avoid it if we don't overfeed them. They also tend to get very, very, very fat and very fast. So you have to be really careful not to overfeed them, even if you're just feeding hay. Uh, they are surprisingly good metabolism. They, they get absolutely every nutrition out of nutrition out of everything they eat. So that's, that is something you have to be aware of when managing an Icelandic horse is that they cannot stay out on the pasture all the time and just assume that they're going to regulate their, their eating habits because they don't. Right. Yeah, the, they are uh, what we would call, refer to in the ranching world as very easy keepers. <laughs> they, um, easy. yes, they, they gain very quickly. Um, someone asked, how often would it be too cold to ride in Iceland? Iceland doesn't get anywhere near as cold as it does in Vermont. Um, Iceland doesn't generally get much below zero, where in Vermont, we can get to 40 below. And that is the same as Celsius and Fahrenheit. So it's very, very, very cold. Um, I generally do not ride when it's colder than maybe 25. So I don't know if anybody's good at Celsius, they can figure that out, but it's maybe less than 10 degrees, minus 10 degrees, 10 degrees of frost and Celsius. Uh, it's rarely that cold uh, in terms of temperature in Iceland. In Iceland, you have to deal more with the wind and you know the rain and, and that kind of thing. So generally people give horses some time off in Iceland after the roundups and you know before well, until Christmas, they, they pull their shoes and give them a break. And then in, at Christmas, they bring them into the stables and start working them. So Christmas is generally the coldest time of the year here in Vermont. Uh, we would not start riding horses at Christmas. We would wait until March, maybe. So generally, it's, you know, if you're worried about it being too cold to ride, you need to worry about parts of the US rather than Iceland. In Iceland, it's more like, do you really want to do it? They make these great insulated riding suits that a lot of people here like to get to so that you, you know, you're, you're, you're totally protected from the elements. And you know, the one thing you do have to worry about if you ride in cold weather is to bring your horse into the stable when it's sweaty because you don't want your horse to be wet from the inside out and the outside in. That, that way they get very, very cold. But if you dry them off after they ride and then they go out into bad weather, they're fine. I have a question here about the cost of getting into Icelandic horses and whether mm -hmm. they are more expensive than other breeds. If you have to ask, you can't afford it, right, Carrie? Yeah. Um, yeah. When I was first looking for my horses uh, back in 1997, a friend that I rode with said, well, if you want a gated horse, I know this really nice Tennessee walking horse that's for sale. <clears throat> and so I went and tried him and he was beautiful, black Tennessee walking horse about 15 or 16 hands, and he cost $800. Fully trained, beautiful, healthy horse. I went to Iceland and bought two Icelandic horses and spent $10,000 instead of $800. If I did that today, each horse would be $10,000, and that would probably be a big bargain. Uh, I would now budget $15,000 per horse if I was going to bring them over from Iceland. So yes, it is much more expensive than your average, um, even your average gated horse. They're more on the same line as Frisians or other rather spectacular breeds. So those of us who have gotten into Icelandic horses and have ridden them a lot, would never go back. Uh, 
you just kind of recalibrate what you think is expensive and what you think is not expensive. Right, Carrie? It's a lot, it, yeah, it's a lot like living in California. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yes. There, there are cheaper, cheaper places to live, but if that's what you want, that's what you want. That's right. So, that's yeah. Right. If you if you ever find an Icelandic horse that's a that's being sold as a trained riding horse for less than $5,000, you need to ask some really serious questions. Uh, you could occasionally, you can find, you know, you know, a foal or a young horse that will be less than that, but take into consideration that they usually need to be trained by someone who is used to Icelandic horses so that you can separate the gates. And that costs about $1,000 a month. So if you buy a horse for $1,000 and then you have to put four months of training into it before you can ride it, you've got a $5,000 horse. And you don't actually know the quality of the gates until they're trained. So it gets very complicated. Um, you know, for people who don't understand gated horses, and, and actually most gated horses don't have a trot. So Icelandic horses have both the trot and the tolt. So when you're walking, you're sitting on the horse and you're walking and you say, get up. The horse will ask you, which way do you want me to move my legs? Do you want trot or do you want halt? And you have to answer that question. And if you don't know how to answer that question, the horse will, can, will mix up the gates. They'll give you a few steps of this, a few steps of that, depending on what the surface of the ground is like, because they don't really care if you are comfortable sitting on them. They just want to cross the ground, right? So if you don't know what you're doing and you try to train an Icelandic horse, you'll just get a mishmash of a combination of gates that is convenient for the horse, but is not convenient for the rider. Uh, when the horse is trained by someone who understands Icelandic horses, you teach them a certain cue. When I do this, you do that and then the horse will trot. When I do this, you do that, and then the horse will tolt. And if you are consistent and it is clear, the horse is happy to do it. It's just, you, you need to give some instruction. So that's um, you know, one of those complicating factors. And then you have the next step, go faster. And the horse says, what, canter or pace? So again, you have to know the cue, you have to know how to sit, you have to know, you know, the, the horse has to be taught, this is what I mean. And there are ways, there are, there are various ways of teaching these different gates. So you have to make sure that you were taught the same thing the horse was taught. So it, it gets complicated, but it, it also is one of the things that makes having Icelandic horses a, you know, lifelong learning opportunity. Because after 20 years, I am still a beginner. Um, put me on a different horse and I got to learn it all over again. But it's, it's very much fun to do that. It is. And I think one of the things that, um, you know, for, for those of us that are new to the breed, even having 30 years or 20 years or 40 years of experience with other breeds, um, it's, it's a different way of writing. And, um, you know, if you, if you haven't, uh, it, you can expect to need to invest some time and money into training yourself or having yourself trained to, to be able to, um, manage all of that appropriately. Um, so yes, it is, it is not the cheapest breed. And a lot of that is, because, um, you know, when the, the cost to import a horse from Iceland to the U.S. is about $6,000 right now. And if you uh, live on the West Coast, you have to get them from New York. Um, so it, in addition to the, the price for the horse, you've, you've got that expense as well. Um, and then if you're new to the breed, you can expect to be buying your first Icelandic saddle and your first Icelandic bridle and all the other really fun things that, that come along. But it's, um, it's been a wonderful I think, thing. 
I think the important thing that you said, Carrie, was you need to train yourself. And that's what makes it so rewarding is that you learn an awful lot about yourself when you're riding these horses because they're not bicycles, they're not machines. You have to negotiate with them. You have to communicate with them. You have to learn their language or you end up on the ground and sometimes it doesn't feel real good. So I learned, for instance, you know, that I uh, don't really understand where my left ankle is and it doesn't work the way my right ankle does. So I have to really concentrate on that. Um, I also had have to learn to control my fear. So when I get afraid, my horse gets terrified. So I have to never get afraid. You know, I have, to, I have to be the strong one. You know, I have to be in control of myself no matter what's going on because the horse I'm riding is going to go nuts if she thinks I'm afraid. So these are, you know, important things to keep in mind. Yeah, I, um, I had another question here about how well Icelandics get along with other breeds of horses. That's open to debate. Uh, we had a couple of articles in the quarterly on that subject, and it's very individual. Uh, some Icelanders recognize other horses as being the same species. They won't have anything to do with them. Some Icelandic horses don't mind at all. They tend to be the herd boss, no matter what you know else is in the pasture with them, but once they have established their, uh, their role, they seem to be fine with horses of other breeds. Uh, some of them get along well with goats. You know, it's, it's just very individual. Uh, sometimes, actually the domestic bred horses tend to do better in a mixed herd because they may have been introduced to them before, um, depending on the size of the herd. And the Icelandic horses some, from Iceland sometimes um, you know, are expecting to be in a big herd and don't know what to do with a small group of other breeds. So it, it, it depends on the horse. And it's a, it's a character issue as well. It's not just a domestic versus imported thing. It's definitely a character issue. So when you go to buy an Icelandic horse, you need to talk to the person that you're buying the horse from and and find out, you know, how is this horse with horses of other breeds? Now you won't find that out in Iceland because there are no other breeds. So if that's how you're gonna to have to keep a horse, I would recommend looking for a domestic bred horse first, or at least a horse that's been in, in America for a while and has been exposed to this sort of thing. Um, maybe a horse that's being kept with only one other horse uh, might might do okay with one of another breed, but again, you, you've got to find that out before you buy the horse. Good advice. Um, I have a question here about what, what can you or can't you do with an Icelandic horse? I think you can do pretty much anything. Uh, you're not gonna win any prizes for jumping or eventing <laughs> if, you know, the fences are too high, but they do jump. So if you just want to jump logs, you can do that. Uh, you're probably not going to win any prizes in dressage, except for the lower levels and, you know, breed specific. I mean, there's, there's now a breed specific award for Icelandic horses in dressage. So you can do that. I know people who do fox hunting with, with Icelandic horses. Um, people who work cows with Icelandic horses. I mean, what other things would you wanna do? They're great for trail riding. Uh, there's a number of shows in the US and there may be more. There's now, we're now doing virtual showing so you can show from anywhere in the country and, and be scored against uh, other, um, other riders in the US IHC. So there are, there are opportunities for showing you can enter any kind of an all breed show because they do trot. So if you have to do walk, trot and canter, you can do that. Um, I remember when we've got our first horse, I made my son take a 4-H uh, 
program on horsemanship and at the yearly roundup, he was the only gated pony in his class. So of course he won the blue ribbon and gated pony, even though he couldn't get the horse to actually gate, but he's still got his blue ribbon. So you can, you can do 4-H, you can do pony club, you can do all kinds of things with an Icelandic. They're very versatile. Oh, you can drive them. I know people who do driving and ski oaring, um, obstacle courses, uh, agility. What else is there, Carrie? Distance riding, camping. Distance riding. Right. Yeah. 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 Camping. Right. And, and I mean, you, you would look at them and think that they're, they're not cut out for endurance riding, but they actually do really well. They do um, really, really well. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they're very versatile breed. And um, one of the things that I really, I do quite a bit of trail riding. And one of the things that I really appreciate, and, and maybe this is a, pl- I have a, a horse that was raised in Iceland, but has been in the US for 11 years. So I feel like I have the best of both worlds. Um, but he is so careful about where he puts his feet. I mean, we can go on these tiny little sheep and cow trails and he just never misses a step. Um, he's so methodical. Now he can be a goofball at other times about other things, but like when we're out on the trail and he's working, man, it is head down all business. We're going to get somewhere and it's great. Um, it, it's a lot of fun. That's one of the reasons that I like to ride in Iceland as much as I can, because you go to Iceland and you suddenly realize, oh, wow, look at what these horses can do. Yeah. Uh, you know, talk about going over rocks, you know, going through water, going up steep hills and around, you know, tiny little trails on the sides of cliffs. They just do everything. Yeah. And, and you know, at home, we kind of baby them by letting them walk through that kind of terrain. And in Iceland, no, you do it at a tolt. You know, you just go. So, yeah, yeah. I, I know we're almost out of time. And I, I definitely want to hear uh, a little bit about the trips. Uh, are there the trips you've got planned in Iceland this summer, the treks? Um, are, is there still space available in those? Well, what I'm doing, I'm working with Gwithmar Peterson, who runs Hesteland, which means horse land. And Gwithmar runs like a horse camp where he does lessons and trail rides out of the farm. And I take the people who don't want to ride out sightseeing and talk about sagas and history and culture and that sort of thing. So we have organized this for people who are traveling with non-riders. So one, one spouse wants to ride and one spouse doesn't want to ride. And so that's how you know, this particular tour has come about. I've been doing just the, the sightseeing part of the tour for about six years now. And I like to base it out of, of uh, Guthmar's farm just because it's a beautiful part of the country in, in West Iceland and it's uh, a very saga rich area. Plus, it gives me the opportunity to go for a horseback ride every morning. And any of the guests who want to do that with me can do that and also do all the sightseeing in the afternoon. But we decided to combine you know, my tour with his horse camp so that we could get people who had non-riding spouses. So this is actually the first year that we're doing it that way. We had it set up that way for last year, but everything was canceled. So yes, there are still a few spaces. The first uh, tour starts on May 31st and the second one on June 7th. And you should go to hestaland.net. Or you can just Google, go to my website, nancymariebrown.com and there'll be a link there. But then Budmar also offers all kinds of treks and you know more, more difficult things. Uh, but then- right- we wouldn't have the the saga expert but with us. Don't get the sagas now. <laughs> well, and and what amazing quality horses um, 
mm-hmm. and to to be able to experience Iceland on what a what a treat. Um, so we're right up at, at, at six o'clock and it looks like we've answered all the questions. Um, any last words of wisdom for folks that are thinking about getting into Icelandic horses? Well, I would say just do it. You won't uh, ever regret it. It certainly was life-changing for me. And to now have my husband go out riding with me every day is, is pretty much the dream come true. So I would, I would say just go for it. Me too. <laughs> I would say that too. <laughs> <laughs> and go experience Icelandic horses in Iceland. Definitely. I think, yeah. Definitely. I think you really understand the breed in a different way um, when, when you experience them there. Oh, and there's one last, thank you, Nancy. Great evening listening about Icelandic courses. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I would also like to second that. This has been a wonderful seminar. Uh, thank you so much. Um, your passion from both of you just shines right through. So (laughs) it's, it's been just Wonderful to listen to you this evening. Um, I would like to just take a minute to talk about um, our next webinar. And please excuse my voice. I've, the allergies are kicking up and I'm suffering a little bit. Um, we, our next webinar is scheduled for uh, Tuesday, June 8th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we will have Christine Ingolf's daughter uh, joining us from Reykjavik to talk about the Lafer Erickson Foundation. And I wanna thank Nancy Murray Brown for bringing uh, this to our attention. Uh, if you are uh, in college or you have someone uh, who you know who's in college and is going to be looking at grad school and uh, is planning or would like to do their uh, graduate work in Iceland, or if you're in Iceland and you'd like to come to the United States to do your graduate work, um, this would be a really good uh, program for you to attend. Um, so it's uh, again going to be on January or on June um, 8th. And uh, we'll have more details uh, coming out uh, in just uh, another week or so. Um, Nancy and Carrie, thank you again so much. This has just been a really enjoyable time. And thank you everyone for attending uh, this evening. And good night. Good night.